But anyway, welcome in everyone. We are going to start the show by talking about Crown Jewel before moving over into Metaphor. Three, two, one, exactly, Kaylee. Yes, if you guys want to see these reviews live, I do them live now. If you follow me on twitch.tv slash nomad eric for those of you watching on youtube right now please follow me uh i'm i'm i i like to think i'm funny at least i try to be funny and entertaining i don't know if i actually am or not um but we are here to discuss crown jewel crown jewel was the most recent wwe uh ple that came out um yesterday uh saturday was the event i uh, i personally thought it was a really good show i know that it's as a lot of them have been lately very polarizing opinions on the internet, depending on who you ask. Um, also, a fun thing that I've realized lately is depends on which website you ask. Um, some websites, they, they trashed it, they hated it, others loved it. Twitter is Twitter, as it seems to be. Blue Sky see, is where I spend most of my casual time now, uh, but I don't have enough wrestling content over there. Everything is AEW, and I don't do AEW. So if you are on Blue Sky, or if you are on Twitter, follow me. Because I, I typically live tweet uh, these events. Uh, yes, that is an XL. I've actually went to WrestleMania uh, 40 at, in Philadelphia. So that's where I got the hat from. I don't know how crazy I am about the 40 at the, on, on the bill. But it's okay. We're going to work with it. But we are here to discuss this. Uh, a seven match card that technically there were seven matches. But only six actually happened. Which we will get to as uh, we will break these down. What you will see above my head is Rob's reviews. As always, Rob always gives me reviews. He always helps me out with these uh, to make it so that we're obviously comparing multiple things and taking averages here. Um, on the left side there, you will actually see my friend John. John is uh, also a big wrestling fan alongside me. Doesn't always submit things for reviews, but he has lately. If you've watched a lot of these lately, you'll see that John has been giving his reviews a lot as well. That's added usually a fourth member, a fourth voice, or a fourth vote um, to uh, the entire thing. But Kane, unfortunately, was not able to watch it. Um, Kane was actually at a concert yesterday. Uh, the PLE was actually more in the afternoon time or evening for him, so it was actually at a time where normally he'd be able to watch it, but he was at a concert, so as he put it, just like CM Punk, the Hell in a Cell match exhausted him, so he was going to miss the Saudi show. Um, but we are here to obviously break down these, um, yeah, to obviously break down these matches. John's is over there. Uh, you'll see that both John and Rob, they do theirs um, through a, a, an alphabet scale, um, A through F. Uh, I do mine 0 through 10, with a 10 or a 9 being an A, 8 and 7 being a B, 6, 5, and 4 being a C, 2 and 1 being a D, 1 and 0 being an F. Haven't had a, 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 an F or a D lately, uh, and honestly, I think we managed to get away from it again. Um, in this production here. Uh, as you can see, if you look, just uh, take a glimpse at the reviews, you will see that both Rob and John had very differing opinions on this show. Mine kind of lines up right around the middle, so it's going to be interesting to see where these all end up coming up. But we are going to start with the obvious one, uh, and that is the Bloodline versus OG Bloodline. New Bloodline versus OG Bloodline is this little card down here. Uh, it was a uh, three on technically three, but really four. You had, obviously, you had Jey Uso and Jimmy Uso teaming up together for the first time, joined with Roman Reigns, who is a good guy now. He's the face in this show, versus the OG Bloodline, which was Solo Sokoa, Tonga, uh, Tonga Loa, Tama Tonga, and Jacob Fatu. Uh, Tonga Loa did not technically participate in the match. It was technically Tama solo and jacob but obviously you knew he was gonna get involved and he did um the match was fin i i listen the match was okay to me story-wise i thought it was phenomenal you had uh and, and if you look up there with with john's breakdown there you'll see that he agrees with me here match was very slow uh it, it, but it was intentionally slow in my opinion you had Jay and Roman, they don't want to tag each other in. The only reason that Jay tags Roman is because they took Jimmy out and he had to. 
Um, you had that hesitation where he's tagging in Jimmy instead of Roman early on. J Roman isn't in the match very much because obviously you're, 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 you, the entire thing is this fractured, splintered relationship between these cousins. Uh, after literally half a decade of Roman Reigns manipulating them and driving a wedge between them and forcing Jay out and Jay goes off and Jay proves he doesn't need his family. He can do this shit on his own. He doesn't need Jimmy. He doesn't need Roman. He doesn't really need Sammy. He doesn't need any of them. Damn sure doesn't need Solo. And now he's having to come back because Solo is bringing in the criminals in the family and the, 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 the Tongaloa and Tamatanga. He's bringing in the criminal of Jacob Fatu. Using real world things into these stories, by the way, Jacob Batu does have a criminal record. He has come clean. He's gotten clean because he's had kids and he wants to be a good uh, example for them. That's bravo to the outside of wrestling, Jacob Fatu. But in wrestling, Jacob Fatu, the man's a fucking monster. I don't understand how a man that size can move at the speed that Jacob Fatu does. I don't understand how that man never seems winded. I don't understand how Jacob Fatu can seemingly do everything and anything. You put him against anyone, and I think he can make a great match out of it. He can squash people and make it believable. He can have a long, drawn-out fight with one of your top stars and hold his own and look like he could be one one day. I absolutely love his entire character. I love the bag of tricks that he has. I love his his repertoire, his his his, his moves that, that he has. And he also works great on the OG the new bloodline because he gives the new the new bloodline a, a bit of a, a needed oomph, if you will. I, I do love that Solo is coming into his own. I think the match ended great. I thought that it had the right winner. Solo Sokoa needed to go over Roman Reigns, and the fact that they had Solo pin Roman is extremely important. They now have one win apiece, pinning each other, and this is obviously going to lead to War Games going in end of November. So, I gave the match a 6, because again, slow, methodical, pacing, intentional, still not super entertaining match-wise. Story-wise, I gave the match an 8. I thought it was excellent storytelling. I thought it was excellent story progression. I thought it, it moved things forward. I can't wait. Set uh, the ending with Sami Zayn coming out to save them after the match. Um, them surrounding Solo. Solo rolling out. Sami Haluva kicking Roman Reigns instead. Jimmy pissed off that he thinks he did it on purpose. Jay knowing that he didn't. Separating everyone. <clears throat> Set, Sami Zayn really not giving a shit that he accidentally kicked Roman. Yeah, he did it on accident. But he still doesn't give a shit that he did it. Um, that's extremely important information there to, to kind of take from that entire thing. So I thought all that, uh, exactly, see, uh, the long-term storytelling of Sammy Kicking Roman, it was great, it was perfect. Um, I completely agree with basically everything that, uh, John put up there. Again, I, I'm gonna balance this match out to a 7. Story-wise an 8, match a 6, balance it out to a 7. As you can see, Rob gave it a B, John gave it a B, they, they're very ample about B, B pluses and B minuses and stuff like that, so I think putting this match at a 7 is fair and just. Moving on, we have the women's fatal four-way match. For the tag team titles, we have Jade and Bianca who would win it. They were going up against uh, the Sky Pirates, Io Sky and Kyrie Sane, Piper Nevin, and Chelsea Green, and the new, I, I assume they're now SmackDown superstars? Lash Legend and Jakari Jackson, they're technically NXT superstars, but they've been on the main roster for the last two or three weeks now. Obviously fighting the Sky Pirates in NXT, but let's be honest, Metaphor is probably getting caught up here soon. They are part of that faction. They're probably all going to come up. I wouldn't be surprised if you don't see these two permanently on the main roster. Uh, I thought this match fucking killed it. I thought they were excellent. I thought everything that they tried to do worked. I thought all of the women got a chance to shine on this match. I thought that, um, I, 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 I don't know 100% how I feel about Jade and Bianca winning it again. It makes sense. You want them to be legitimate. And also, I know for a fact we're going to get Jade versus Bianca at WrestleMania. So I know that's where we're leading to. So I know that them dropping the titles at either the Royal Rumble or Survivor Series or the Elimination Chamber, they're going to drop the title at one of those pay-per-views or PLEs, whatever you want to call them. So 
when they do finally drop them, I think that's when you're going to see that split. And obviously, you don't want to do it too quickly. So I can see the two of them probably holding the titles up until Rumble or Elimination Chamber. So because of that, I'm fine with Jade and Bianca winning this match. I've also heard some rumors since technically Monday Night Raw was filmed. Uh, I'm, fil I'm Obviously, I'm live today, but for YouTube, I'm, I'm streaming this on Sunday. Raw is obviously on Monday, but they actually recorded Raw in Saudi Arabia today because they're doing a UK tour this week. So Monday Night Raw tomorrow night, or today when this is uploaded, is actually a taped event. And I've heard some rumors about EO Sky, and I obviously stopped reading after I saw her name. But I believe that she might be being featured in title contendership again, potentially. So, with that being said, I'm fine with the Sky Pirates not winning. I would have been fine with Jakari or Lash winning. But then again, I think maybe they need a little bit of time to season up. Chelsea and Piper, I don't know if you could take them seriously as champions. But they always perform really well. So, you always have to have them in the mix. Overall, I thought the finish was great. I thought uh, Lash and Jade would make great singles competition at some point as well. Uh, huge fucking pop for Jade Cargill holding Piper Nevin on her shoulders for a solid 15 seconds for Bianca to set up the uh, the Doomsday device on her. Absolutely great. Amazing strength. Again, totally fine with the finish. I thought everyone here performed well. This was huge for the NXT ladies. They actually They absolutely showed that they belong. They absolutely shown that they have improved drastically because I remember when Last Legend that was on NXT Level Up, very green, very rough. Jakari Jackson was a little bit better, but you could tell that there was a couple things holding her back. I think Last Legend has improved so drastically that it's actually helped bring up Jakari Jackson as well. So I can't wait to see what they do from here. Overall, I gave this match a nine. I loved it. I thought it was absolutely incredible. As you can see, John actually agreed. Match was phenomenal for the lack of time it was given. The male ring announcer is not Samantha, though. He did not hit the Chelsea Green right at all. Didn't even try. But he actually gave his match a 9 as well. Rob gave his match a B+. Plus. That's going to be an 8. Two nines and an 8. It's going to end up sticking with a 9. And I think that's exactly where it belongs. This match would have probably been match of the night if it wasn't for another multi-person match that we're going to get to in a little bit. Next up, we have Seth Rollins versus Bronson Reed. This was a match that I was really, I guess, kind of circling, if you will. I, I was really excited to see this. Uh, this was, and I, and I, I, I thought, I thought I knew this, but it was confirmed at the event. This is Bronson Reed's first ever one v one at a PLE. He has never had one. He was supposed to have one. These two were supposed to fight for the World Heavyweight Championship at Elimination Chamber, but A, Seth Rollins got hurt leading up to WrestleMania, and B, Bronson Reed was having a kid, so he wanted to be with his wife. The universe just didn't align for that match to happen, so they had it now, and I thought it was a perfect timing for it. I think Bronson Reed has been built up great. I know a lot of people weren't crazy about Seth Rollins getting um, the win here. A lot of people thought maybe Reed should have gotten the win here, but if this isn't the end of the feud, and it sounds like based on the way the match ended, it is not the end of this feud, I'm okay with Seth Rollins taking the dub here. Personally, I thought the match was phenomenal. I thought the match uh, had amazing flow. I thought Bronson Reed had some great offense. Seth Rollins sold the hell out of everything. Bronson Reed looked phenomenal. Seth looked healthy, which is the most important thing coming into this. And I thought the finish was great. Um, Bronson Reed going to hell with the match. I'm hitting you with the steps. Uh, taking it out. Bouncing his head up the steps. Taking a, step, uh, a stomp to the steps. Taking a stomp in the ring. Taking a super duper stomp off the top turnbuckle. I thought it was great. I, I, I And then after the match, yes, yeah, Seth Rollins got the win. Bronson Reed stands up and it's just blood pouring out of his the, the, the top of his eye where he got gashed at. Just standing there looking like a monster, like, I'm not done with you. And Seth Rollins going, you're not human. What the fuck are you? Absolutely chief cinema. I don't know if it was the 10 out of 10 that John gave it, though. John loved this match to, 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 to an obscene level. <laughs> he gave this match a 5-star, 10 out of 10 slobber knocker. I thought it was absolutely great. I gave the match an 8. Uh, Rob gave the match a B- minus as well, so he also gave it an 8. But uh, I'm going to have to do math here because it, it might end up coming to a 9 here. 
um, with 8 plus 8 plus 10 divided by 3, 8.66. Yeah, it's going to end up being a 9 um, because of John's 10. Um, and again, we don't do the point rule, and 0.66 would be kind of weird anyway. So yeah, thanks to John, this match is going up to a 9. This is going to be on the same pacing as the women's uh, Fatal 4-Way. I thought it was an excellent match. I think they have a better one in them, so that's kind of where I was at with the eight. I think Rob probably agrees with me there. Rob's you're in chat now, so you can probably confirm there. But yeah, I I I yeah, I'm completely fine with that match getting an eight or a nine. Don't know about the ten that John gave it, but you know what? That's why we have multiple opinions on here because everyone sees things with their eyes. Don't listen. I know this is this is gonna seem super hypocritical coming from me, but when it comes to wrestling, maybe don't get all of your opinions from Twitter. Because Twitter's done gone so bad now, um, that it's, as far as wrestling goes, I mean, it's garbage anyway, but especially for wrestling, the IWC is just trash, and it's so funny that in, in three matches, we've given a 9, 9, and a 7, and if you ask a lot of Twitter, they gave the event like 4s and 5s. And as you can tell, based on just these two reviews, not even mine yet, this match was Far better than a fucking four or a five. But we're going to obviously continue on to the next match, which was Nia Jax versus Liv Morgan. Now, this is probably going to be the most polarizing one in terms of all of our opinions. Um, mostly because I think me and Rob agree here. But as you can tell, once again, John severely outpaced me and Rob. Now, in... The match's defense and in John's ratings defense. I was a little bit distracted during this match. I made the mistake of watching, and again, uh, Rob's in chat, and don't take this the wrong way. I made the mistake of watching it with people. Um, so I wasn't able to super hyper focus on it. I was more content on talking with them and talking about things. When I'm sitting here at my computer and I watch these things, I'm much more hyper focused. It's right here. It's in front of me. I can see it a little bit better because the TV has a bit of a blue tint to it. I can see things better. I can hear things better because I've got my headphones in. So I can hyper focus on these matches a little bit more without with less distractions. I think John kind of had the benefit here. So for me, this match didn't give me enough for me to ignore the company that I had in the living room when I was watching this. I felt like it just there was something missing from this match. And then right when I felt the match was getting really good to the point where I was like, hey, y'all, hold on, this match is cooking. Tiffany Stratton got involved, which I was fine with. I was excited for that. But then Judgment Day got involved. And then by the time you finally hit the pinnacle, it's over. It, it, it was done. Um, I, I did like the drama of it all. I think the right person won. Mostly because, and that's not a front to Naya. I think Naya has definitely earned everything she's gotten since Queen of the Ring. I think that Naya deserved to be champion. But I feel like you're looking at two women, again, unless the rumors of who's going to be fighting Liv Morgan next are true. Because I don't see how you can let Liv beat Io Sky if that is the case. And that is what happens on Monday Night Raw. And it's Io Sky versus Liv Morgan. She, she's losing the title. The title's done. You can't. You, you, Triple H wouldn't survive not putting the title back on Eos Sky. It's just not going to happen. And also, I think Eos Sky versus Ray Ripley would be an amazing match. But with everything else, assuming the rumor is false that Eos Sky is not going to be the next contender, or Eos Sky gets screwed out of the title somehow by Judgment Day, which I think would be kind of shitty, regardless, you're looking at two champions that are heading in different directions. Liv Morgan is heading up. She's going to start winning, 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 and cement herself in the, the I guess, the, the echelon of champions. That's why they had her win here. And then you have Nia Jax that is starting to, that has already hit her peak, slowly crossing it, and is going to drop the title to Tiffany Stratton here before too long. Uh, unless this is Liv Morgan's peak, that could be the chance. Maybe this, you know, you, you gave Nia Queen of the Ring in SummerSlam. Now you've given uh, Liv Morgan uh, Crown Jewel. So maybe that was what they did here. You know, Nia got hers early. Now Liv gets hers, and you both drop the titles in the next month or so. That could be it. That could be what happens here. Um, and if that's the case, then I'm fine with it as well. Um, I agree with Rob here. Rob in chat it was very awkwardly long, where where Nia was like just kind of standing there waiting for Raquel. Some cue times might have been missed there, which probably hurt the match a little bit, but not enough to where I think this match actually sucked. 
I gave it a six overall, again, because nothing quite caught me to the point where I was like, shut up, guys. The match is on. Rob seemed to agree, gave his match a six as well. John, however, John gave his match an A. He gave his match a nine, saying that Liv and Nia had great in-ring chemistry, and the Tiffany Money in the Bank angle plus JD interference is perfect for the story. So, John, so basically, everything that me, and, and I'll comment on that in a second, Rob, but everything that me and Rob were like, I'm not crazy about this, John loved, which is the beauty, and again, that's the beauty of wrestling and the beauty of these reviews. The three of us, we do share very similar opinions on a lot of people, but we also have very, very drastic differences and a lot of wrestlers as well, as you will see by the main event. Take a look at Rob's rating there, um, and you can kind of see one of the wrestlers there that Rob doesn't care too much for. So again, we're obviously very different in our opinions on these things, so you expect some results like this. I was not expecting to have to do math here, though, because now I have to do six plus, <laughs> plus nine divided by, okay, so uh, seven. So the math, it's going to balance out to a seven. That's fine. It, it's, you know, a seven is, is probably good for this match. 3.5 is what it would break down to a star level. Uh, but Rob did mention something here in chat. I don't like what they're doing to Tiffany. Uh, it's priest all over, it seems, with the belt with the briefcase i disagree strongly because they know you, in order for the money in the bank to work you have got to add stakes and in order to make the briefcase holder not seem stupid you have to make it so they look like they're going to cash in and then something causes them not to be able to do it it sounds like a repeat story but it's a repeat story that needs to happen. The only other reason you would not cash in immediately upon winning the damn thing is because you're so cocky or you want to wait till a particular person wins the title so you can cash in on them or something. Otherwise, you have got to stretch this out. You can't have quick cash-ins all the time. Do I think that Tiffany Stratton should hold this bitch until WrestleMania like Damian Priest did? No, I think that's a bit of a long time to hold the briefcase, but it worked. And it worked out for Damian Priest. He won it on the grandest stage of them all. And that's a story he'll always have. It Sometimes you just have to go ahead and accept the story beat for what it is and move past it. And I think the Tiffany Stratton briefcase right now is one of those situations. Moving on, though, to the next match that didn't actually happen, but kind of happened. Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton. Uh, the match was waved off after uh, they decided to beat the shit out of each other. Um, immediately upon... Uh, the match starting, Randy Orton charges after Kevin Owens, and or Kevin Owens charged Randy Orton, regardless of how it started. They basically brawl throughout the entire arena. The bell never rings. They beat the shit out of each other with everything and everything. Uh, they bounce each other off of tables. They bounce each other off of steps. They bounce each other off of, of, tape, of, of uh, uh, chairs. Uh, the GMs try to get involved. A fucking Adam Pierce takes an RKO. Can't wait to see how that happens. Someone thinks that based on the Twitter reactions after that, that it could legit start a SmackDown versus Raw angle because it's like Adam Pearce flat out said, Nick Aldis didn't do anything. He did not interfere. He rolled out of the ring. You watched your fellow GM take an RKO and you leave? Watch that storyline, folks, because I think Survivor Series might be Raw versus SmackDown after all. So, it could lead to a lot of really cool, fun things for Survivor Series. Um, but... Then they start, they brawl all across the entire stadium. Uh, they brawl to the crowd, and then it ends with the patented swanton slash elbow drop from Kevin Owens through Randy Orton through the backstage tables, and they both lay there, and it cuts to commercial. I loved it. I would have liked a match to have come out of it, but I was fine with what we got. Um, I, I, and again, um, I agree with John here. John said it right here. While them beating the shit out of each other was cool, it was too short and the match never actually happened. So John kind of agrees with me here. I, I loved what we got. I feel like I, I still want to see these two have an actual match and maybe that's what we're getting for Survivor Series 
is an actual Randy Orton versus Kevin Owens match. I mean, maybe these two are just going to pull a Bronson Reed and Braun Strowman and just fucking feud and beat the shit out of each other and brawl for the next four weeks until uh, Survivor Series. It's a very strong possibility. Um, maybe we end up having a triple threat for the title. Um, for for, for uh, Cody Rhodes' title at Survivor Series between Kevin Owens, Randy Orton, and him. I think that would be a fantastic match to have. So, a lot of places they could go with this because this match didn't happen. So, for a story reason, it worked, and I'm fine with it. And based on Rob's review here, giving it an 8 out of 10, and also me giving it an 8 out of 10, and John giving it an 8 out of 10, we're all kind of on the same pace here. Would have loved to have seen a match completely fine well actually technically john gave it a seven out of ten but the two eights are going to balance it up to an eight um i think we're on the same mindset here would have loved to have seen a match out of these two but we're not going to complain about seeing what we got moving on to in my opinion the match of the night um it obviously it does look like this is a similar situation this is basically a reverse uh from what me and uh john here where john gave the um Bronson Reed and Seth Rollins a 10 out of 10. This was a 10 out of 10 for me. I was entranced throughout the entire contest. I loved every single thing about this match. I love that you put three people that can go. Three people that have high work rate. Three people that are great at speed, great at technicality. I do believe that you let your, your champion get a little bit out-wrestled here. I love LA Knight. He's a great competitor. He looks great with the moves that he does. But he is a little bit older than these young guns, and that makes it so that way he can't quite keep up with them as much. I uh, basically DIY castrated himself by missing the turnbuckle. However, he recovered and hit a beautifully perfected German suplex out of it. I thought that Andrade came out of here looking phenomenal. I thought, um, I personally thought that Carmelo Hayes cemented himself as a future champion here. I thought the finish was one of the most genius, well-timed, original, out-of-nowhere finishes, the double BFT. Absolutely phenomenal. I thought that there was a series, there, there was one series in particular where I literally jumped off the couch, because again, I was watching it in the living room with Rob and our, our roommate Vic. I literally jumped off the couch. It was like uh, BFT, Carmelo Hayes catches the ground, jumps up, Goes for the kick. He misses. He goes to hit him with another one. Hit him with the backdrop. He flips. He catches him. BFT attempt pushes him into the hidden, uh, you know, the, the fake kick back arm by Andrade. That entire series, you know that, like, you know that, like, that, like, meme online where it's like, you know, that, you know, this match is making me want to take my shirt off. It, you know, you see it with a lot of people with, like, sports and stuff like that. That was a shirt off moment for me. Like, that was so fucking good. I love this match. I thought it was perfect. I thought it was a potential all-time classic. I gave this match a 10 out of 10. Absolutely perfect. No notes. As you can tell, clearly needed some notes. Uh, John gave it a B plus. Match was fast-paced and great for the time it was given. Needed more time to get a higher mark, in my opinion. I can see that. Again, you had a seven-match card. You knew things were going to have time shaved off on, like, a five-match card. It's unfortunate, but that's just that's the give and take that we get with these cards. So, can certainly understand that, but I took this from a microcosm of what we got, and I thought it was perfect. Uh, Rob gave it a high B. I'm going to go ahead and assume that's an eight as well, uh, because I just can't see how Rob could give this match less than an eight. Uh, if you meant a seven, I'd love to hear why you think seven, but you did say high B, so I'm going to say... 7.5, bump it up to an 8. So we have a 10, 8, 8. This is going to end up being another 9 situation where it's like an 8.66. Um, so you are going to go into the 9 category. So basically, John and Rob did to this match what me and Rob did to John's 10 out of 10, uh, which is pretty interesting. Kind of funny how that ended up working out. But again, as you can tell, folks... I don't see how anyone online gave this fucking event a 4 or 5. There's no way. There's no way that you've watched these six matches alone, or five matches and whatever the hell you want to call Kevin Owens or Randy Orton, and gave this show a 5. I mean, you're that, that is generational hating to be hating, and I'm just going to assume you watch AEW and nothing else. That that's, that's what I'm assuming here, because I don't see how you watched this and, and gave it what you gave it. Uh, moving on to the... 
final match. A match that I knew was going to be controversial because I did not see a way where you could have either one of these two win and not piss off the other's fan base. Uh, unlike Naya and Liv Morgan where, you know what, whoever takes the pin, it's fine, it makes sense, we move on. This is your two bell cows. It, arguably, you're, you're the greatest intercontinental title champion of all time in Gunther, who's now trying to cement his place amongst the names for the World Heavyweight Championship. And you have Cody Rhodes, who just ended the four-year reign and is now the de facto face of the company. Obviously, I figured that Cody Rhodes was going to win this match, but I knew that there was a chance that they could have Gunther pull up the upset and then use that for story-related purposes to show that maybe Cody Rhodes isn't the GOAT. Maybe Cody Rhodes has some weaknesses. Maybe that's something that Randy Orton and Kevin Owens can, can you know, work with. But instead, Cody Rhodes comes out on top. And I'm completely fine with that. I, I actually, I personally loved the finish. And you'll see on John's remarks down there that it was a very controversial finish. I, again, I understand some people hate roll-up pins in general, but for me, it's fine to, if you're trying to protect someone who's supposed to still be one of your main your mainstays. You gotta have these two fight. Everyone wants to see them fight. Everyone wants to see who's gonna come out on top. To protect them, you have a roll-up win. Um, I don't see how you can continue Gunther as this dominant heel champion if he takes three crossroads and loses. It just doesn't, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. But you also can't have Gunther beat Cody like that. But there was two particular things that I read about this ending that make a lot of sense. And which is why I actually am giving this match a 9 out of 10 rather than the 8 out of 10 I was going to give it. And it's actually because of the finish. Let me explain. Two things. One, someone mentioned that this is the exact same way that Bret Hart beat Roddy Piper in WrestleMania 8. If you go back to my reviews there, you can actually see us talk about it. Why is that important? Because just two or three weeks ago, or at the last event, the last PLE, Bad Blood, Gunther had an entire promo basically trashing Bret Hart, saying that he was a, Go he was a Goldberg fan. Bret Hart fucking hates him. So to have Cody Rhodes beat him the same way that Bret Hart won a match at WrestleMania? Pretty poetic given what Gunther said about Bret Hart himself. But there's a second reason that is extremely important for story purposes. You see, Gunther's only lost two matches in like the last, what, three years? Once to Sammy, once to Cody Rhodes. Why is that important? Because in both of those losses, it came when Gunther was his most cocky, his most egotistical, his most personal with the exception of Damian Priest who probably would have beat him too if it wasn't for the Judgment Day getting involved. So the thing is he was so adamant and you saw this on Friday Night Smackdown where he choked him out and Kevin Owens went to beat the shit out of Randy Orton. Gunther was so and they, they also mentioned some commentary too which is why this this theory has so much stickiness to it. Gunther was so hell-bent on making Cody pass out. That was his entire goal. That was his entire intention. That's why he didn't even attempt a pin after the powerbomb. He didn't attempt a pin after the lariat. He didn't attempt a pin at all. He hit his moves and then went straight for the fucking sleeper. He was so adamant to make the golden boy of the WWE pass out or tap that it cost him in the end. His cockiness is the biggest character flaw of Gunther's character and that's so fucking poetic. From a fan that watches this shit solely for the entertainment value, that's that's what I, that, that, that's why I watch wrestling. That's why I watch this shit. It's for little details like that. Chef's kiss. Perfectly done. And that's why I'm giving this match a 9 out of 10 instead of an 8 out of 10 because of that story. Cinema as some of you kids call it. So I gave the match a nine. Rob, fucking, I don't know what happened to you, man. I don't know I, why you have a hate boner for Gunther. I will never know. Rob hates that man. I'm pretty sure that Rob has never given a Gunther match more than a six or a seven. He gave it a six. I gave the match a nine. John gave this match a B plus, which is an eight. Um, saying Gunther and Cody are two of the best technical wrestlers on the roster. Uh, and they showed it. Te te technic 
Technical wrestling is not boring, Rob. You have to watch it from a certain mindset. It's boring to you. You're not a fan of that style. Me and John love that shit. Again, like I said at the beginning of this review, and again, for those of y'all wondering where his words are, they're in my chat. You should watch these live. Um, but again, from, from, from a wrestling standpoint, that's just what we're into. We're all into different things. So obviously I'm joshing you a little bit when I, when I criticized the, the score. Um, but like John said, Gunther and Cody are two of the best technical wrestlers on the roster, and they showed it. Beautiful counters and also awesome grappling. Love the back and forth nature of the match, but I hate roll up finishes. Could have been better there. He would have liked some sort of a submission or pass out, or maybe uh, Cody reverses the sleeper into one of his own and makes Gunther pass out to his own move. That would have been a great finish as well. But again, I think going back to sort of what I was saying earlier with the poetic. Uh, Bret Hart callback, I think it makes it work a little bit more for me. Uh, but John gave it an 8 out of 10, not an 88, Jesus Christ. An 8 out of 10, divided by 3, we get a 7.66, so it is going to end up averaging out to an 8. Uh, so neither me nor Rob are going to get what we want there. <laughs> um, but a 7.66 is going to end up getting it bumped up to an 8. So that is where we're good. And again, regardless of how you feel about Gunther, regardless how you feel about that Nia Liv match, regardless of how people may feel about the OG Bloodline match, even though obviously the three of us were all in, 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 in agreement there that that was phenomenal, regardless how you feel about Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton or, or, or the Fatal 4-Way or what have you, there's no way anyone with a sane, respectful opinion gave this card a 5 out of 10. It's just not possible. I, I don't see how you could do it. I would love to know your guys' opinions in the comments down below. I would love to know your opinions here as well. Why you think what we gave a combined 8.14 is a 5. Where is the 3 points? Where is the literally star and a half, effectively? We gave this entire event, basically, if you round it down, 4 stars. That's pretty fucking good for an entire event. And you're going to sit there and tell me that this was a two and a half star event. I would love to see what happened to that star and a half. If you would love to tell me down below. Uh, you guys have a fantastic uh, night on YouTube. For you, for Twitch, don't you fucking go anywhere. We're st we still got shit to do. Um, we're, we're doing, we're double header in this shit, right? You, you're, you're not allowed to leave, Twitch. You stay put. You can't go anywhere. We've got, we've got games to play. But for y'all on YouTube, y'all have a good night. Enjoy Raw. Enjoy wrestling. And I'll see all of you guys in the next review. Peace.